If I had to choose one sport that embodied Englishness, I think it would be cricket. Sport and the British. Cricket and the English hero. Last week we looked at how sport divides us by class, by race, by gender. This week we look at how it unites us. National teams serve both to express our separate identities as English, Welsh, Scottish and Northern Irish and to hold us together as British. A dual identity then with fierce rivalries but underlying solidarity. The hero is the key to understanding how sport shapes national identity. National sport is a story we tell ourselves about ourselves in which the character of one man comes to stand for a whole nation. So what is the English story? Professor Richard Holt. In my view, there's two kinds of English hero. There's the old-style country gentleman, the 18th century country squire, the John Bull ideal of the Englishman, the bulldog Britain. And there's the more reserved, clean-shaven, decent, modest, stiff upper lip public school boy, which becomes the general image of the Englishman in the 20th century. Cricket has two stories that embody these two kinds of hero. The first is W.G. Grace, the mythical, robust and combative Englishman. And then there's the story of Jack Hobbs, an English everyman for the 20th century. The great opening batsman, modest, respectable, sober, church-going, an ordinary man who could do exceptional things. I've come to Lord's to the high-ceilinged, hallowed long room with the view of the pitch behind me and around me on these bluey, sea-green walls, portraits of players and presidents from the past and, most imposing of all, the tall, bearded, wide-girthed figure of William Gilbert Grace, W.G. Grace, in front of me with his red and yellow hooped MCC cap and playing in what looked like brown brogues, which even more add to the effect of him being the archetypal Englishman. Cricket has come to represent an Englishness that transcends social classes and reflects more a demeanour, a manner of behaviour and a sense of fair play. Coming down the steps from the long room to the edge of the pitch, you suddenly feel right. Now we're in the 21st century. There's the bubble-like spaceship media centre at the far end and you can hear the traffic of London whizzing by, but... When you look at the history of, of cricket, it started very much as a country sport and it spread into Scotland and Wales and Ireland, yet it was England where it took hold most strongly. It was the introduction of the steam train, really, and the wider spread of the railway network that meant the game could tour the country. And word spread fast. Teams, particularly William Clark's famous professional All England eleven, became extremely well known. Certain individuals became nationally famous. Alfred Minn, the greatest batsman before Grace, and then William Lillywhite, played in a top hat, and whose family went on to form Lillywhites in Piccadilly. From the 1860s, a new brand of cricketer emerged, the public school gentleman amateur. This cricketer would be the blueprint for successive generations of future cricketers, like Dennis Compton and Lane Hutton, for Hammond and Hobbs between the wars. They were professionals, but they would look to the ear of the gentleman amateur for inspiration and leadership. As cricket spread across the country during the latter half of the 19th century, it caught the attention of all social classes and of both men and women. Lucy Baldwin, the wife of the interwar Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, wrote in the first issue of Women's Cricket in 1930... Cricket to me is summer, and summer is cricket. For me, cricket was born on a hill in Sussex, below the blue of the sea flecked with its white sails as our horizon, the crack of the bat against the ball amid the buzzing and humming of summer sounds is still, to me, a note of pure joy. 
There's a museum here at Lords, and it's absolutely packed with the artefacts that tell you the rich history of cricket, whether they are bats from the old days or balls or caps or pads. And in a glass cabinet, protected by an alarm, is the tiny urn that represents the zenith of English cricketing achievement. The ashes are here. And right opposite the ashes is the bust, just head and shoulders, of the most famous gentleman amateur cricketer, it's W.G. Grace. He was born in 1848, the son of a country doctor who had played cricket and a mother who was a genuine cricket fan as well. Grace himself was at the height of his powers in the 1860s through to the turn of the century and he alone could pull a crowd like no man. Grace was, without a shadow of a doubt, the most famous sportsman of the age. Simon Ray, author of W.G. Grace, A Life. You might only have one chance to see W.G. in your entire life, but you would certainly take it. I mean, there are countless stories where he would turn up with a scratch team, bowl most of the overs, bat through the innings, win, take his fee, and then get back on the train and do it all over again. Despite his large frame and his obvious love of a good meal, he was probably the first sportsman to apply a strict work ethic to the game. He had extraordinary stamina and a will to win that was evident from his very first big score of 170 against the gentleman of Sussex when he was just 15. He couldn't afford to finance a full-time cricket career and yet, if he was to be accepted as a gentleman, he couldn't be paid to play. And so W.G. Grace, who had qualified as a doctor like his father, found a solution to ensure that he made a living from cricket, and a good living at that. Grace, as in most things, was a one-off. He played as an amateur and would be furious at any suggestion, and there were a lot of suggestions, that he wasn't a proper amateur. But he undoubtedly made far more money from the game than any of the professionals. This would always be put down as expenses, Um, but basically it was appearance money. Very good friends of his would say, oh, WG, come over and play in a benefit match or something like that. Yes, he'd come, he'd score his century, he'd delight the crowds, and then he would basically put in a bill. And one or two of his friends said, no, no, that wasn't, no, but it was. And you couldn't argue with WG. And it was like the Titanic arguing with the iceberg. There was only going to be one winner. He was completely inflexible. Grace's first-class cricket career spanned 44 years. He played his last match for the Gentlemen of England in 1908. It was his 880th first-class appearance. He was a colossus, but he knew it. The late 19th-century sports journalist Arthur Porritt wrote... About Dr W.G. Grace, there was something indefinable. A wonderful kindness ran through his nature mingling strangely with the arbitrary temper of a man who has been accustomed to be dominant over other men. W.G. Grace had become the first British sporting hero. He symbolised the rise of the middle classes. I've travelled across London from Lords to the Oval, where the Hobbs Gates mark the career of a man who made his debut for Surrey in 1905 as Grace was bowing out. And here in the long room at the Oval, his portrait looks down... A very different man in style and shape and size. He's got his hands in his pockets, his blazer looks a size too big for him and his face doesn't have that air of dominance that Grace has in every picture you see of him. But Jack Hobbs also became a national hero and he showed that the working classes could achieve success in sport. Albert Lawton, speaking in 1953, remembered that match when the two players faced each other. It's no use asking me to compare the two, Grace and Hobbs. In those days, with all his promise, I don't think that anyone who saw Jack could have dreamed that one day he would... No, wait a minute. Yes, perhaps there was one man. If there was, if anybody at all felt that he was someone who would eventually beat the Masters' records, it was very probably Dr Grace himself. Jack Hobbs was held up as the model Englishman of the interwar period. The son of a Cambridge College servant, he was brought up on the fringes of the middle-class elite. He was modest, reliable and good-humoured. 
He never swore. He drank only in moderation. He was a devoted family man, and he ran a successful sports business in Fleet Street. He was known as the Master. And in his honour, his friends formed the Master's Club in 1953, the year in which Hobbes was knighted. David Raven Allen, the writer and broadcaster, sums up the appeal of such a self-deprecating superstar. In a way, he followed on from Grace as the great British hero, or English hero and such, but they were so totally dissimilar. They could not have been further apart. Hobbes epitomised all that was right about cricket. Celebrity would be the totally the wrong word to apply to Hobbes. He was not a celebrity. He was part of the English consciousness. He was part of the English psyche. Once Hobbes came down these steps and onto the field of play, he turned into a run-making machine. His batting style was described as technically perfect, and Hobbes went on to beat Grace's record of 126 centuries, finishing his career with 197 first-class hundreds. That is still a record today, and you may remember was the final question for the jackpot prize in the film Slumdog Millionaire. Hobbes adored the game of cricket and the life it had given him. From the days when I played second fiddle to that great batsman Tom Hayward, opening a Surrey County innings, I've remained in debt for ceaseless help from other players, and from spectators too. If I had to reply again to a question put to me well nigh 60 years ago, what would you like to be? The answer would still be the same, a cricketer. It's a grand life. I've come up to the roof of the pavilion stand and it's a fairly grim day. I'm afraid there'll be no play today. But you still get a great idea of the intimacy of this ground. And beyond the gas towers, I can see the flag flying above the Houses of Parliament and coming round to the right. I can see St Paul's through the chimneys and I can see the gherkin as well. And it's a great viewpoint from which to reflect on the careers of two very different men. W.G. Grace and Jack Hobbs, because it was Hobbs that behaved more like the amateur in his demeanour, and yet he was the professional player. Grace behaved like a professional and earned more money than most of them ever would, and yet he was part of the era of the gentleman amateur. He was the great showman, the leader, with his larger-than-life presence. Grace defined a certain type of Englishman. In his slipstream came a very different hero whose modesty and honesty would define a new ideal of English manhood. Jack Hobbs showed that you could be quiet, determined, even low-key, and still succeed. I'm standing right opposite the Test Match special commentary box from where John Arlott would have given many ball-by-ball commentaries. He was also a poet, and he turned his verse to Jack Hobbs in honour of the master. (laughs) 